Now I'd like to welcome Dr Mahesh Kumar, uh, Head of Department at the Calvary Mater Newcastle in Radiation Oncology. Uh, hello everyone, good morning and uh, thank you for inviting me to give this presentation and also thank you to Mark Hughes Foundation because for, for the last couple of years there's been a lot of changes, particularly with the support which has been given by Jane and Sandy to all the patients and to nurses as well. Um, this is going to be slightly or significantly different to what James has sort of talked about. Uh, there's going to be some, a uh, few of the slides which will just give you a background of the evidence behind which what we do. And uh, I've tried to sort of keep it quite simple and uh, I'll rush through those type of slides. Um, and it's, it's a mixed talk, it's not sort of specific to one part of what I generally do. So just to give an outline, I'll try and cover some background decision making as to how I go about deciding what should be done, imaging and what we do in terms of technique, planning, treatment process, uh, slightly touching on re-radiation, side effects, future and other challenges which are there. So this is one of the worst cancers to have, the other one being the pancreas. So both of them, we haven't made much progress over the last maybe 50 years or so, apart from the timazolamide coming in 2004 and more recently, uh, somewhat a provocative type of treatment. And it's got significant impact on family and patient. So that's just to go back to the studies which were done to sort of prove that radiation was useful. That's in the 70s. And this is, uh, this is New South Wales, 2012 data, so the top graph is cancer incidences, the bottom one is the mortality from that. So both of them reflect a significant burden on the whole population. So what do I do? So I go mainly by performance status and that's something similar to what James was telling us to how well the patient is after the surgery or just before surgery as well. And I've kind of put down global assessment just reflecting on the, their sort of dating myself there. The other important thing which I look for is what sort of quality of life the patient is going to get after whatever we would end up doing. And whether it's going to be important from a patient's point of view and the family point of view. And then whether they've got other comorbid conditions like diabetes, hypertension or other brain diseases. Uh, age, generally I put down at the bottom of the list when I want to make a treatment decision. Uh, so this is just to go through what's involved when we sort of look at performance status. So you, some of you would have wondered why I asked some weird questions about how they sort of manage things at home, what they've been doing six months back, how they are now. So all that sort of helps to come to some idea of what the general well-being has been. And uh, that's, that's been validated in the past studies and also the STUP study which was which sort of brought in the tumosolomide, they subsequently validated that those type of classifications are useful to try and come to a decision. Uh, another thing which is not very well known is where this tumor is located in relation to the rest of the part of the brain. So one of the things which is there is called subventricular zone. So that's where some of the brain cells sort of generate or regenerate. And depending on where it is located in relation to that, you can have different behavior. So we sort of, we haven't yet just found out how to exploit that yet. So for suitable patients, so this everybody knows this, so this is the standard stup regime which is 6 weeks of radiation plus timidal plus timidal for 6 to 12 months depending on how the patients go. And what happens when we don't have patients who are fit for that? So there's been quite a good number of studies over the years and uh, I think one of the things which I was asked to sort of briefly mentioned was what we do in those situations. So you have a study which looked at six weeks of radiation versus three weeks. They didn't find any difference and so that three weeks regime is a fairly considered as a standard regime. And there are a few other sort of treatment options. And most recently there was one uh, which came out 
comparing three weeks with one week. So I generally don't use this. It's only very seldom I use it. Having said that, so this is the new thing now. This came out last year. So for patients who are not fit for six weeks and temozolomide, we can do three weeks and temozolomide, and that gives a good outcome. So I'll briefly touch on both sort of scans and things which are there, which I generally use more for deciding how and what to treat and things like that. So diagnosis generally is made based on MR and uh, you have surgery. Then the other things, advanced imaging, spectroscopy, diffusion tensor imaging, perfusion imaging, functional imaging, then you have amino acid PET scans and then you have targeted imaging. So what does spectroscopy do? So it basically looks at what chemicals are there in different parts of the brain tumor and it can give us an idea of whether there is a high grade tumor or a low grade tumor or there is necrosis. So in this particular thing there is just because of the way certain chemicals are in relation to others one would think that there is actually a high grade tumor. There. As contrast, in contrast to this one, where we're not sure if somebody sees this, then they'll think that yes, there is tumor progression, but it's actually due to treatment. So there's a lot of necrosis, so it's actually not cancer there, it's more radiation necrosis. So we could end up doing something different if we didn't have this type of tool. Then functional imaging and diffuser tension imaging. So functional is basically to try and identify which part of the brain is responsible for what function. So if, if something is close to, let's say, where your hand is going to move, then you can get them to do that action while they're having an MR, and that tells us where things are. So here, so you have, that's the tumor there, and that's where the brain excites when the right hand moves. So that's useful for me as well, because then I can make sure that I don't give a high dose of radiation to that part, and we can actually use that information currently at Martin. And this other thing is, it's about fiber tracking. So one of the things which we know, uh, the brain is very well connected within each other. So the cancers, the GBM particularly, tracks along the fibers. So we can identify where it is going. But the drawback is we haven't yet figured out how to use that information. And then FET PET, and then there are a few other amino acid PETs. Uh, this is not funded currently, so I sort of use it when I'm not sure what is going on with the rest of the other imaging which I have at my disposal. So here, so we have this area where it's not very clear what's going on because we couldn't see it on other sequences. So doing this PET PET, it actually showed that it was active and this person went on to have surgery and then that came back as a GBM. And the same thing was here, this was very deep and uh, biopsy your surgery was going to be difficult and again this helped in deciding what we do. Uh, so how do we do the radiation? So the days gone by, so this is like in the 60s or 50s um, and to some extent in the 70s you had the whole of the brain treated to a fairly high dose of radiation, so practically five to six weeks. And then they did two small studies and then found that you can actually treat a smaller volume and still get away with it. The current recommendation is you have a margin of around two centimeters and what you have to sort of bear in mind if you take a sphere and the volume is basically that formula there and it's actually cube of the radius. So if you just increase the volume by half a cm, the amount of brain which is going to get included is almost a cube of that volume. So it becomes quite large. So one has to be really careful what we do. And the radiation dose is uh, 60 gray. That's been established since the 70s. There have been a lot of studies which have looked at uh, giving higher doses or giving uh, stereotactic radiotherapy boost to what we do normally. So there's nothing which is shown that it's useful. So that's the current sort of standard which we would use. Uh, I thought I'll briefly touch on what happens in the planning process because all of that happens in the background. 
and patients, families, and even other disciplines actually don't have an idea of what we do. So everybody is familiar with the simulation where you have a mask and a CT scan. Uh, we use a post-op MR because there is alteration in anatomy, shifting of the brain tissue. And then we do special scans like the ones which I have alluded to earlier, depending on whether there's a need or not. So we fuse or overlay each of these scans onto each other. And then there is an automatic fuse, fusion process. And we mark up the area to be treated. There's usually a peer review of what we are doing. So there's always somebody checking. If I'm marking some area out, then I get one of my colleagues to check. And then subsequently, there is a general QA, which happens as part of the department thing. And there's a whole range of people involved in that. So it is uh, image guidance. So you have KV imaging or chrome beam CTs, which gets done every day of the treatment. And then you have continuous quality improvement activities, which is, for us, it has helped in reducing the margins which we put on. And also, it's sort of contributed to improving the efficiency with the mask system. So currently, most patients get IMRT or VMAT. And there seems to be a suggestion that by doing that, there's probably an improvement in the overall outcome. Uh, stereotactic RT is reserved if we do re-radiation. And uh, what we do is most patients get treated on the true beam stereotactic machine, which is a specialized machine just for treating small volumes. And the other thing which it's got is it's got a six degree freedom uh, of couch adjustment, so it can, can adjust it in six different directions. And it also comes with, so these are what we call as MLCs. So they are thin, thick, constant, plates and we use them for shaping the area to be treated. So in the middle you've got very thin ones and in the periphery you've got the thick ones. So because the thin ones are there, you can actually shape the beam around critical areas and still manage to give high doses to where you want to treat. So and that's so that's for just the downside of having that is you get a low dose splash. So this is um, just a picture, depth. so this part is the brainstem, so that's quite important. So you don't want to sort of blast it with a lot of radiation. So IMRT, VMAT, plus those fine leaves actually gives you to shape that around the brainstem. And the same thing is for this tumor here. And this is, uh, this is just the dose splash, which sort of happens just because of the techniques which you're using. But we do have certain metrics to sort of guide us as to what would be a reasonably safe dose. Uh, then this is some of the stereotactic equipment which we have. Okay, re-radiation. So re-radiation, again, uh, I tend to follow the same principles when I first see the patient for the first time. And uh, patient selection is always the key. And one of the things is location where it's to be retreated. So if it's already close to a critical area which has received a lot of radiation, then the timing becomes important because you, do, you can't do this like three months after finishing the first slot. So then you need to have a much longer time. Um, so generally my sort of uh, time limit is, I would consider that six months after the first slot of radiation treatment just because that gives some idea of how the tumor is going to behave. And you do need to think about balancing this with the toxicity. Um, we do have the tools to do it, but that doesn't mean we employ it all the time. So that's why you need to have some level of uh, balancing act to be done. Uh, there is uh, some uh, merit in considering uh, retreatments because uh, people do live longer after retreatments of any sort so have they can have chemotherapy or surgery or radiotherapy so having said that you have to exercise a uh, lot of caution when you go back in coming back to toxicities um, i think most of this comes in the tanda which gets given out the main things which happens is uh, the cognitive impact, which is quite difficult to sort of manage. And there are various factors uh, which are sort of dependent on how bad or not it's going to be. 
It also depends on how well the patient has been before, whether the tumor is, look, is affecting the cognition right from the start. Some of the cancers or tumors affect the cognition from well before they actually present to the doctor. Um, so what do we know about this? I think the more I read about cognition, the I sort of start to realize how vast it is. In the past, one used to think that if we spare the hippocampus, then everything was okay. But then more information is coming through. Just because of the brain being wired so much, you've got multiple different parts which are responsible for cognition. And also, there's data coming out which sort of says if you spare certain areas, maybe they may be better. But we don't know whether that's how well that's going to be. And this is again, it's just reflecting how the brain is networked and what part is sort of going to affect which part. Okay, so this is uh, slightly going away from GBM and I've put this just because to try and see whether we can improve cognition. Uh, when patients have whole brain treatment, the cognition goes down significantly. So there, there's been efforts to try and see whether the hippocampus can be spared and that way the cognition can be preserved. So this is purely from the whole brain thing which we've sort of adopted uh, to do it for brain tumors as well. If possible, we'll spare some parts of the hippocampus, but always first time around, the primary aim would be to see whether we can control the tumor. So if the tumor is controlled, then the other things we can slowly work on. Uh, then there's another drug, which this drug is used in Alzheimer's disease. So there's a small study which was done, which again shows that there is some benefit, but we still have to have uh, a robust, larger study to see whether this actually is real. So this is just touching on uh, what sort of damage you get from radiation treatment. So there's different parts of the brain which are getting involved. And you can have different options in terms of trying to see whether that can be helped. Uh, just bear in mind, a lot of these things are either lab or in phase one type studies. So they're not for prime time. So how are we faring in NSW? So this is uh, 99 and 2009, so there's a slight improvement over the last 10 years, but this graph, if you look at this, um, this is where brain, lung, pancreas and all is sitting, and that's the survival from 70s to 2010, 11, that's 0 to 100. So we do have to have a lot of effort to try and get these things up somewhere here. Okay, challenges. So this is, uh, I've just put this up so that it's out there and people can start thinking about this. So this is, um, this is a device which you place on the scalp. So these are small, uh, so I, I haven't seen this one physically, but they are electrodes, that's a battery. And you place this on your scalp so you do need to shave your head. And uh, this has been, this study has been done by Stuck, who basically did the uh, other study as well. The interesting thing which we see is, um, so there's actually a difference in the survival curves. So the, and there's a difference of around four to five months in overall survival. So this is something which is out there, but um, it's, it's not something which everybody uses here. Or I, I'm not aware of anyone using it here, uh, as in, in Australia. So. And the challenges which uh, James was earlier alluding to uh, in a different way is this GBM, it, it's not just one thing. It's got multiple different ways of sort of it behaving. So we already know that there are four or five different types based on just the way it looks on the MR scans. And then we know further subtyping and testing, there are more for the types of them. And so this is just the genomic sort of change which happens. So if we see that as a start, then after some time you lose out this, these leaves are getting, branches are getting thinner. So things like that are happening. So what is happening is it's getting transformed or 
one type of cells are getting killed off and the other type is starting to grow up. And so that's what they have labeled as spatiotemporal evolution. And what's been found is this type of thing is there in the in the first for the first time itself. So depending on which part of the tumor you're going to biopsy, you can see a different type of GBM. So that's where the challenge comes in terms of trying to personalize medicine. So you would get one part, but you don't know whether all the other parts are going to be the same or not. So this I took from uh, the cell cycle thing. So there are, uh, in, based on this diagram, which I think this is in 2010 or 11, there are 10 different places where you can intervene. But these are the only 10 which we know of. There may be lots of others which we don't know. So, how do we normally try and find these things? Yes, you do a biopsy or you do a surgery each time this happens, but physically or practically it's not very easy. So you need to find other ways to do that. So one of the things would be radiomics. Then the other thing is whether you can have antibodies and imaging type scans and treatments designed on that. So there, your liquid biopsies might come into play if, if and when they become robust. And then, uh, do we have the time and luxury? So I suppose that's where increased and increasing and increasing collaboration will come into play to try and work on each part of these things. Then there's something called rapid learning systems, which is similar to what I was telling earlier, is you have different groups working on different aspects and try and gather all the knowledge together. Then how do we design clinical trial, whether we need to have more of pragmatic trials which are sort of more reflective of what we see in day-to-day -day practice. Then uh, I think it's time we start talking about survivorship for brain tumors as well because people are living longer. We, so we do need to have some strategies in place for guidance we have what's important from a patient point of view, include more and more people to try and achieve that. So thank you for that, all patients, family, all of you. And I'll leave you with that.